Welcome everyone, thank you for joining us. We'll give everybody just a couple of minutes to complete signing in. We had a large number of people registered for this event. I see 32 so far, but I believe the registration was well over 100. So we'll give it just another minute or two. I just realized um, Janice sent me her bio, but I have it on, well, that's okay. That, that will be at the end of this. <laughs> Stop sharing that. Okay, it seems like we're at 33 and that number hasn't changed for a little bit. Shall we go ahead? All right. Okay. So welcome everyone to Succulent Gardening. Bosca has hosted a number of succulent gardening classes. I'm very excited tonight to have Master Gardener Janice Moody here for our class. Uh, it is co-hosted by the City of Santa Clara and the City of Sunnyvale. Just a little housekeeping, uh, everyone is muted by default and our instructor has even worked into her presentation some pauses for questions. So we will be taking uh, questions through, during the presentation. Um, you can raise a hand or put your question in the chat or Q&A. Uh, the webinar is being recorded. Usually it takes a couple of weeks um, for it to be posted on Bosca's website. And then we encourage everybody to post it on as you see fit, we put it on our city websites also. Oh, and I talked through the raising the hand icon and Q&A, <laughs> pardon me for that. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Bosca represents 26 agencies in the San Francisco Bay Area serving almost 2 million people. Um, the number one goal is high quality water at a fair price. Um, because we have such a high rate of residential density in our area and residential water use over half is outdoors, the primary objective is really focusing on conservation and the landscape for residential customers. Um, because of that, as many of you have seen, we're noticing a lot of landscaping changes. Pardon me, that was an accident. We're seeing a lot of landscaping changes where people are moving to drought tolerant and water wise plants. There are a lot of incentive programs through local agencies, including Bosca. A popular one is Lawn Be Gone to convert your existing irrigated turf to uh, drop tolerant plants. And depending on the city where you live, that rebate fluctuates. So make sure you can take full advantage of whatever rebates are available in your area for that. And as far as rain capture goes, we sure had a lot of that this past winter. There's a $200 rebate for rain barrels offered through Bosca. Valley Water also has a similar program. Smart controllers are becoming more and more popular. Uh, so less hands-on way of irrigating your landscape system. Uh, and you can get really significant rebates for some of those smart controllers. And the rain garden rebate program also has been reinstated um, through several other municipalities. Uh, Bosca offers $300 for rain garden projects. The city of Santa Clara just three weeks ago reinstated their $4 per square foot for our landscape conversion rebate through Valley Water. So if you're in Santa Clara or if you have friends who live in Santa Clara, please ask them to take advantage because apparently $4 per square foot, I recently learned is one of the highest rebates in the state. So 
Uh, we just got a couple hundred thousand dollars mm. added to our budget and we'd love to disperse it. And we always advocate native plants since they require so much less water overall. And we have our Sunnyvale slide. Yes, also following up on rebates, we also have our own rebate for replacing lawns and plants uh, for tolerant plants up to uh, $1 per square foot. Um, please go and check up our website, sunnyvale.ca.gov forward slash save water for more information about rebates and other ways that you can save water at home. And we offer compost for people living here in Sunnyvale at the smart station. So please stop by and make use of these um, incredible resources that the city is offering for the citizens uh, from Monday through Sunday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. You do have to bring your own shovel and container and we also have a uh, wood chips. Um, so please uh, feel free to go and pick up your own compost. There's a lot. So. <laughs> And then I, I believe next slide is uh, repeated from some information that you just gave. Oh, it was the rain barrel and smart yeah. control. Yeah, so, okay. Sorry, I saw we had covered that earlier. <laughs> yeah, no, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So uh, sustainable landscapes, we were just talking about the lawn conversion. Um, this is actually Santa Clara Valley Water District portal. So different uh, municipalities throughout the area do offer different rebates as we've just been saying. So this is just a reinforcement of that wonderful program to convert your landscape to drought tolerant plants. And if you haven't been, uh, if you haven't noticed at Bay Area Green Gardens, if you are doing a do-it-yourself landscape project, they have some amazing um, project samples that you can kind of pattern to your own garden. So plant lists and ideas for different hardscape features uh, is a really nice way to get some good ideas generated for your own landscape. If you do have any questions, watersavings.org is a handy way to get some people to answer and conservation at valleywater.org. They have been very busy, but they are generally you know, getting back to people within a day or two at this point. So please go ahead and contact them for any rebate information or other water conservation questions. We do have a few classes coming up um, in June through Bosca Native and Drought Tolerant Plants, Indoor Edible Gardening, Spring Water Saving Plant Selection, and a Rain Garden Workshop. And if we have a rainy winter again next year, a Rain Garden would be a great thing to have. <laughs> for a lot of people who are in some pretty impacted areas. Uh, and this last slide on barriergardening.org um, is, uh, I'm not as familiar with, with this website, but they do have some nice plant lists and ways to kind of put together plant palettes based on plant categories. So if you're just getting into gardening and you want to kind of straightforward walk through plants, um, mm -hmm. that's a nice place to start. And I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing so I can introduce our host. I think I stopped sharing. Okay. You're no longer seeing my screen, correct? I see a sc your screen. Oh, you I do? do too. Yeah. Okay. There okay, now, now, okay. now we're okay. <laughs> All right, thanks. <laughs> so now you want me to share my screen. Right. right. Okay. So we're moving on to our wonderful instructor, Janice Moody. Um, she has deep roots in the Bay Area. Her family started a nursery in Half Moon Bay in the early 60s. And though she majored in dietetics at UC Davis, her inner passion for gardening never really waned. And after wearing many hats over the years, she found her true calling when she became a master gardener, UC master gardener in 2010. She eventually started Seascape Succulent Nursery and Garden Design in 2016, located in Half Moon Bay. She calls herself a jack of many trades, but a master of only one, which is gardening. She feels so fortunate to be able to work outdoors, doing what she loves most, and sharing her gardening knowledge with others. And we're very pleased to have her here tonight. So thank you, Janice. Well, thank you for asking me. It's always a pleasure to do presentations for Bosca. 
So um, you, you learned a little bit about me, and I don't want to waste time talking more about me. So let's get started because, you know, I'm a senior citizen. I got to go to bed early, like some of you out there. <laughs> Here we go. Um, and for some reason, uh, it's not, oh, finally, okay. <laughs> so I have to let you know what, who we Master Gardeners are, a little bit about us. We are volunteers trained and certified by the University of California to provide community service and educational outreach that helps home gardeners and community organizations garden sustainably and create a healthy environment. We have a helpline you can leave a message at any time of the day and we'll get back to you during our hours. Uh, you can email us as well with photos of your problem plants and we'll be happy to get back to you. You can also become a master gardener yourself um, just by going to our link. Uh, this is, I represent San Mateo and San Francisco counties, but you also in Santa Clara, you have a master gardener. Um, website as well. And I should have posted that here and I'm sorry I didn't, but just Google Santa Clara County Master Gardeners, go to their website and that's where you can sign up for um, becoming a Master Gardener. It's about 15 weeks, one day a week where you're taught by University of California professors many times. And so you learn a lot in those 15 weeks and then you get to share your knowledge and you can continue to learn. Uh, every year we are we're obligated to take so many continuing education units and put in so many volunteer hours. So it's a lot of fun, a great organization. So hope you can join us. So today I'm going to talk about, um, this is what I, my plan is. I'm gonna tell you about succulents. What is a succulent versus another type of plant? I'm gonna discuss the growth factors, what makes them grow, there are several. Then we'll have a Q and A and then I'll go into lens Get landscape design, and we'll have another Q&A, and then we'll talk about care and maintenance tips. And if there's time at the end, there's a 13-minute succulent propagation video, YouTube video, and if we don't have time to watch it today, you can always view it at a later date with the link that I provided in the slides. And I believe that uh, normally the, slide, uh, the slides are sent to participants um, afterwards, and I'm thinking that's the case this time. I'm not quite certain, but I think that's the case. So what I won't be covering are houseplants because they're a, they're a different animal. They, they will survive on indirect light versus direct light and they're potting and you use a potting mix versus earth or soil from the earth. So they're, they're grown differently. Um, I won't discuss container gardening because that's similar to houseplant care. That's potting mix versus soil and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, I don't discuss succulent art projects uh, or, and I touch on cactus a little bit, but not a lot because here in San Mateo and San Francisco counties, we're, we don't grow a lot of cactus. Where you are in Santa Clara County, you can grow more because it's a warmer climate. So I do touch on it a little bit. So let's start off with what is a succulent? It is a drought resistant plant that stores water in its leaves, stems, or roots. And here's some examples, for instance, we've got, uh, let me get my laser pointer working here. Okay. Um, stem, the cac a cactus carries its water in its stem. An uh, aloe here, the spiral aloe carries its water in its leaves. And then over here, echeverias, they tend to carry their water in their leaves and stems, as well as aeoniums. So both Aeoniums and echeverias carry their, hold their water in their leaves and stems. And then um, agaves tend to, I don't have a picture of agave here, but I will later on. And they hold water in their leaves, stems, and roots you normally, as well as these aloes do. It depends on the aloe, but um, they, they can hold water in their roots because their roots are pretty ropey looking comparatively speaking. When you, when you look at agave and aloe roots, versus aeonium roots or echeveria roots, you can, they're visually much more prominent. And then there's some that hold water in just their roots like elephant foot palm, which I don't have a photo of, and not too many people grow that. So I'm not gonna discuss that very much. 
So what makes a succulent plant different than other drought tolerant plants? A succulent is a drought tolerant plant, meaning by definition in the Bay Area that it only needs watering once or twice a month during our dry months. So that's our definition of a drought tolerant plant. There are lots of drought tolerant plants out there. Uh, for instance, this formium over here on the right, that's a drought tolerant plant, but it's only drought tolerant because of its deep root systems. So the, these roots go very deep and tap into the deeper water stores. That's what makes this drought tolerant, along with many other drought tolerant plants that are available. Uh, native, California natives are a good example. They're very drought tolerant. They shouldn't need any water in a normal summer summertime experience um, because they've established deep root systems and they, they grow during the winter months when we get our rains. Whereas succulents, as you notice, this is a root bound formium. So you, have, you visually, you can see all the roots here, right? And they don't last very long in containers, unfortunately. You try to grow a drought tolerant perennial that's not, not a succulent in a container, you're gonna be watering it three times more often. You're gonna have to pull it out, prune the roots off to keep it alive in a container. It's much harder to grow a drought uh, tolerant plant in a container versus a succulent drought tolerant plant. And here is an aeonium that's root bound, but you've, you'll hardly see the roots, right? Because all the water is stored in the stems and leaves of this plant. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody understands the, the differences as we go along. So here's the pros and cons of succulents in the landscape. Pros are very drought resistant, uh, as I just said. They offer year round color and interest, even when they're not blooming. See down below here, this Echeveria is very colorful throughout the whole year, with, even without the bloom. But when it does bloom, it's, it's a real, it's a real uh, spectacle to see. So they're, they have beautiful blooms as well. Um, they are relatively gopher and deer resistant. I will mention a few exceptions to that in some slides, but relatively gopher resistant because their roots are not very visible and they're not. They don't hold a lot of water, so gophers usually bypass them to seek out other, other plants that have much more water in their content, uh, water content in their roots. Um, there are exceptions to that, and that would be agaves and aloes. They have ropey roots, and so if anything's going to be attacked by a gopher, it'll probably be an agave or an, or an aloe. They're usually very easy to transplant, very shallow root systems that you can take a shovel and pop them out of the ground easily and transplant them very easily. They're easy to propagate from stems and leaves, which I'll show you at the end. They're easier to maintain than other drought tolerant plants in the landscape. I do far less maintenance on drought tolerant, on uh, succulent gardens than I do other drought tolerant gardens. So twice a year, maybe you clean up a, a succulent garden versus four to five times for a a drought tolerant perennial garden. The cons are that they're very sensitive to freezing temperatures or hail. And here's some hail damage on this uh, Calendrinia spectabilis down here. So um, fortunately, most of the time, we don't have a lot of that. We don't have a lot of freezing temperatures in the Bay Area, but when we do, we have to get out there and protect our little succulents. And I'll show you how to do that. Uh, many sensitive, many are sensitive to extreme heat. Now, a lot of people think that you know, that succulents are desert plants. There are some that are desert plants, but the vast majority of succulents are not used to extreme heat of desert conditions. Uh, they're very fragile, they break easily. So you have to be careful not to go too deep with your beds. Otherwise you're not gonna be able to get in there and work around them. They're dangerous if spiky and they, they can rot if, if they're kept too moist for too long, as we all have experienced over this past winter with our atmospheric rivers. Oh my God, now how many atmospheric rivers did we have? I'm not sure, but way too many. And so it, it was a struggle keeping plants from rotting in the landscape, but I managed to do it and I'll show you some tips and tricks later on. So here's a growth factor, growth factors. Um, Number one is climate. You know, ideal climate temperature range for most succulents is between 60 and 80. That's a sweet spot for them, but they can grow beyond 80. Many of them can, and many of them can grow even to minus 20. So um, they actually, they don't grow at minus 20. <laughs> They're dormant at that stage, <laughs> but they can survive a minus 20 degree weather. And that would be some agaves, for instance. 
Um, they all need sun because of photosynthesis. As, as you may recall, uh, the growth of plants depend on the sunlight and the carbon dioxide and water to create plant growth and give off oxygen as, as uh, the byproduct. So that's photosynthesis. So all plants need light to grow. And don't think you you know you can't put it in a closet and expect it to grow. Believe me, some people think they can put it in a dark, dark place and have them grow, and it doesn't happen. Um, water, of course, is essential, but just the right amount of water is best for succulents. Not too much, not too little. Air is important. Uh, carbon dioxide, that's what they use to photosynthesize with. And they also need air in their, their root systems so they don't get anaerobic bacteria growing in there. Um, and nutrients, which most of them get it from the soil. Most, most uh, plants will get it from soil and not hydroponics, for instance. So let's talk climate temperature. As I said, most succulents prefer moderate temperatures between 60 and 80, and very few grow in desert conditions. Here's a couple of agaves. On the left, um, frost damage. This is what happened when we you, you might have frost for more than a couple of nights. And this is the tender agave. It just succumbed to it. Um, this is an agave attenuata, which is a very delicate agave, very flimsy leafed, not spiky at all. And it's beautiful, but when hail hits it, it gets pinged really badly. That's that's my agave here in the in the at my nursery, as a matter of fact. It'll eventually recover, don't worry, because the new growth comes from the center and the old leaves eventually die, so it will recover, but that's what happens. Um, and primarily, you, you have to, when you when you buy these plants, it's, it's a great idea to look up where they come from and try to mimic their natural environment as best as possible. You know, do they grow in the high deserts of North America? Or do they grow on the, on the slopes of South Africa? For instance, these spiral aloes grow on grassy mountain slopes in South Africa and can oftentimes be covered by snow and they can survive. So that's what they've acclimated themselves to. And so if you keep that in mind, then you know that growing these spiral aloes in, in an area that's over 85 degrees on an ongoing basis is going to be a struggle. Whereas it, and then here's a Dudleya growing along California coastal bluffs, growing out of rocky crevices where drainage is really important and where temperatures don't get very low. So you have to keep that in mind. Dudleyas have a real bad habit of rotting in the in wet winters, like a lot of mine did. So um, I think it's because they they're used to very good drainage. And then there here's some agaves in the desert of Sedona. Um, they're surviving. They're not thriving in Sedona's weather, but in, you know, if you grow them here in, in the Bay Area, oh my gosh, they'll probably get twice as big. And I happen to have an agave americana in the backyard in here at my nursery. It's supposed to only get six feet. It's 10 feet wide now. It's it's a monster. People, and I call her Audrey, you know, little shop of horrors. <laughs> She's quite a spectacle. So um Keep in mind, there are two groups of succulents, basically summer growers and winter growers. And you'll find that the summer growers are the ones that are hardest hit during a really wet, wet winter. Um, these are the ones that kind of suffered the most during this wet winter, except for Oscularia deltoides, this bottom one here. It, it, it seemed to do okay. And euphorbias, Euphorbias are like cactus. They're, they love heat, love good drainage, don't do well. When it drops below 50 overnight, they just stop doing well. So it, it's a struggle to keep euphorbias alive here in San Mateo County. Maybe in Santa Clara, it's different. You can, you can get those um, fire sticks to grow to tree size, but here we, we can barely keep them alive over the winter. So um, just keep in mind, these are the summer growers, agaves, echeverias, euphorbias, Oscularia deltoides, this pink ice plant down here, Petalanthus, which I don't really even see around here, but I mentioned it because I see it growing in Southern California a lot. Sempervivums or the hen and chicks, very tough plants. And they're summer growers, but they can survive winters under snow. They're really remarkable. 
and of course, cacti are summer growers. So these are the ones that you have to watch out for that will more likely rot in a very wet winter than the winter growers. And if all you do is remember the summer growers, then you can remember everything else is a winter grower, basically, because the list is a lot longer for winter growers. Here's, here's my list. And these are primarily focused on landscape plants. Uh, not the little specimens, uh, collector items that you might order online or anything like that. We're, we're talking landscape here. So these are the ones that I would typically plant in the landscape that are winter growers, and it's everything but the summer growers that I previously mentioned. And aloes happen to be winter growers. So my spiral aloe in, here in my on my nursery in, the, in my backyard it did fine over the winter, even despite this really wet winter, because it was growing actively and helping sucking up water and growing. And, and, um, and I had it mounded. And even though it, I had two agaves just die right next to the, my spiral aloe, but my, uh, my spiral aloe survived as well as my other aloes in, in the pots. I threw out a lot of agaves though in pots and there's some, some are more susceptible than others. The thicker leafed agaves are more susceptible to rot than the thinner leafed ones. Okay. Um, so when temperatures do drop, this is what I do. I only protect my most prized specimens. And that would be like right here is an agave attenuata uh, ray of light. And I take some rope light white row cover material and put it out if I expect hail or frost, anything below 32 degrees, I will cover it overnight. And that did protect my agave ray of light this year very successfully. But you have to really be on top of the weather reports. And you can get the alerts sent to your phone too, which, which helps. So do sign up for those, um, those weather re report alerts if you can. These are the most cold hardy succulents that you can grow, you know, in, in snow areas, basically. Um, and I don't grow a lot of Semper Vivums, the hen and chicks over here, because they're very small normally, and they're not very colorful. So they tend to blend in with the landscape dirt or the soil. And so if you, if you don't see it in the landscape, I don't, I don't think it's worth planting. But in pots, they're great in pots, you know, they're, they're a nice little addition but I don't do a lot of Semper Vivums in landscape. This Delisperma cooperi, I have other um, ice plants that I prefer. This one happens to be the hardiest one though. And then seed and repressed stray lemon ball, I use this a lot and it does survive winters very, very su su successfully. Here's some other Bay Area cold hardy succulents. Um, this Oscularia deltoides, this pink ice plant at the top did very well. Stiff leaf agaves like this Queen Victoria agave here, this quadricolor agave. Um, the other ones would be um, blue glow, agave blue glows. They have a very stiff leaf and they can survive to minus 20 as, as long as it's a dry winter and not a really wet winter, they, they'll do fine. I did lose one of those in the landscape though, because it was just too wet and the uh, patio just drained right into them. Um, sedum golden carpet is right here. It survives pretty well. And then I, uh, the sedum repressed rate Angelina and lemon ball, I told you about that is not shown here, but that's the previous picture I showed you. Sedum confusum is right here. I use this one a lot. It's very hardy. And uh, remarkably, Apuntia, Mammillaria, and golden barrel and monkey tail, they all do, they all hold up pretty well in dry winter. Uh, cold, dry winters, because I think because of their little uh, hairy nature on the outside of, of their surface, it helps to protect them a little bit more from the cold weather. And then yuccas also are very hardy in the, in the cold weather. Uh, here's the spiral aloe. Um, just thought I'd show it to you again, because it is one of the, one of the remark most remarkable specimen plants you can, you can own. I love it. Um, they can withstand, and I actually grow them from seed here in my nursery because they're so hard to get um, from seed. There, there are cloned ones out there that I don't think spiral quite as soon, 
but um, I prefer the seed germinated ones. And they're, they can withstand occasional snow, but they're not very heat tolerant. So I always tell people, honestly, when they come, I always ask them, where do you live? And if they say the valley, I say, well, it's going to be a struggle to keep this alive in the valley, just so you know. So I like to tell people the truth. And here's some um, frost tender succulents, the, one that didn't, the ones that did not fare this winter very well. Many are from South Africa. And there are many crassulas, this red fairy crassula over here just kind of withered in the in the frost. It wasn't it didn't take much for that to start bending over. Euphorbias as it sticks on fire. That's what it looks like in the wintertime around here. It looks pretty sad. Many senecios, um, many calanchoes like this Lucii flapjack. It always looks terrible in the winter. Now they're recovering now that it's warming up. And many aloes um, are, are pretty frost tender, except most of mine did fine, and especially the, the uh, polyphyllet alley, the spiral aloe that did fine. Um, here's some other Bay Area frost tender succulents, so the agave attenuata caris stripes right here. As I said, the attenuatas are very uh, flimsy in nature. They're, they're not stiff leafed at all very tender. So they suffer from hail damage and frost damage easily. That's a, that's a canary in the cage, as you might say. So when you see the tips of your agave attenuata drooping, you know you had a frost the night before. Um, they, they're more susceptible when they're in pots versus in the ground. I didn't have nearly the problems with um, these plants when they were in the ground versus in pots. Uh, my Kiwi aeoniums, they suffered a lot with the waves of frost that came through if they were in pots, but in, in the landscape, they held up really well. So there is, there is some protection, uh, I, and I'm not sure what it is, but I think it has to do with the microbes feeding it the right nutrients they need. And I'll be discussing how the plants get their nutrients from the soil in the uh, next few slides. Here's uh, some that really survived well throughout the winter in the landscape and in pots. The darker colored aeoniums, these uh, aeonium velour, this Swartz cop over here. The Echeveria pulvinatas did pretty well, and they have a little fuzzy texture to their leaves, and I think that helps protect them from the cold. And this um, Opuntias did okay. They, they weathered the storm pretty well. Um, cotyledon pig's ears, Semper vivum says, of course, they do find these two in the front. Kalanchoe pamilla, this little one over here with a little pink flower, that is a remarkable plant. That's a great border plant. It has a blue gray leaf and a pink flower, and it all of them did really well in the landscape and in the pots. That's a prize winner right there. Um, Sedum rupestre, the one in the front. Um, and Graptivaria opalina, this one here does did really well. And Graptopetalum pinky over here, that one did well as, as well. So here's the heat and sun loving succulents, which I don't grow very many over here in Half Moon Bay, but if you've got warm enough weather where you are in Santa Clara, um, the golden barrel are pretty tough unless we have a really, really wet winter, then, then they'll ex experience rot. Uh, is, again, the euphorbia sticks on fire, love heat, and you've got to put them against a the south facing wall if you want to try to keep them through the winter. I think that's the best bet. Opuntia, um, they're pretty hardy. Those, I think they come from a high, high desert area in North America where they experience cold temperatures quite a bit. So they're, they're tough plants. Here's the sorted agaves that love the heat normally. The, the variegated ones don't tolerate as much sun as the non-variegated ones because of the yellow striations in them. You might notice some sun burning or some damage um, with the agave attenuatus, for instance. They, can, they, they usually are a little bit better if you put them in some light shade if you've got extreme heat where you live. And this Portolacaria, Portolacaria afra, green-leafed one, is, is really tough for um, the sun and heat. Other heat-tolerant favorites are this Oscularia deltoides, the pink ice plant I keep talking about. It gets massive, by the way. It can grow four to five feet in the landscape. So 
allow a lot of room for it. And Crassula arborescens, silver dollar J did really well here this winter to, it, with the cold and uh, apparently with heat as well. And here's a, an aloe striata. And in some aloes, I, I saw them growing in Davis at the Botanical Garden, and they tended to tuck them underneath other, other plants just to keep them out of the strong afternoon sun. They seem to hold up better if they're not exposed to like full hot sun all day long. Heat and cold tolerant agaves. Um, all of these did really well this winter with the cold. And of course we don't have any heat, but um, all of these survived pretty well. The only exception would be this uh, perii retro choke right here, or actually, yeah. It, it tended to rot a little bit because the leaves are a little bit thicker in nature than all the other leaves. All these other leaves are thinner. This one has a thicker leaf and this one tended to rot a little bit more easily. All right, so sun. They, most, most of the succulents that I have require a minimum of four to six hours of sun per day for photosynthesis and growth to take place. There are some like Haworthias, Gasterias, um, and the String of Pearls, for instance, some of these other ones that I don't really grow in the landscape that I offer here at the nursery, but those, those are um, shade loving ones and um, they, they can't tolerate, they don't do well in, in full sun. So there are some that can grow in indirect light and many of those you can grow indoors. But as I said, we're talking landscape here. So for the most part, they need at least four to six hours of sun to do well. And if it's um, if you have hot afternoon sun, then a lot of times it's good to put them in uh, morning sun, if if that's where you what whether you experience where you are. And again, variegated to yellow yellow leaves prefer less sun. And um, take a look at this Echeveria elegans here on the left. That's what it looks like in full sun after winter. It pinks up from the cold weather and the sun. And this is what it looks like when it's grown underneath another plant and it's hidden from the sun. It's reaching, it's just like elongating between its stem regions here, seeking out the sun. And finally it peeks through and here it reaches a little bit of sun and starts growing normally. So this is what happens when you take a plant that needs sun, you put it in inside or you, you put it under a tree, it'll get leggy on you reaching for the sun. That's a natural tendency for the plants to do. Okay, so also keep in mind that the sun changes its position in, in the summer months and the winter months. It's much lower in the sky, shorter days. So in the winter, the shadow on this side of the building is going to be much deeper. So you have to take that in, into consideration for your winter growers. Make sure you give them adequate sun if they're, if they're growing in the winter. Don't put them right up against the north side of the house. Um, where you where you um, live in Santa Clara, I don't know. It may be a little different, but here, you know, our I think our winter growers tend to grow longer here in Half Moon Bay because of our mild climate. We don't get that extreme heat that you get. So I can grow some aeoniums, for instance, on the north side of our my building here. Whereas where you are, by that time the sun is is in the summer is reaching over the building, and it may be too much sun for them. So um, just keep in mind that summer solstice is high in the sky and the shadows are less and winter solstice is low in the sky and the shadows are greater on the north side of your building. I hope that makes sense. I, I might be a little confused. It's late. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, okay, aeoniums. This is what happens if you try to grow some aeoniums in Sacramento, you, you might experience some really burnt leaves on the outside, especially if the aeonium is mostly yellow and there's very little green variegation in it, that's much more susceptible to sunburns. So when you're choosing a aeonium sunburst or kiwi, try to look for the more greener varieties versus the more yellow ones. And then you'll be more successful if you have hotter climates. And this is a kiwi with sunburn here. And this happens to be a swart cop aeonium. 
that experienced sunburn only because it came from a greenhouse that had shade cloth over it. So it wasn't used to seeing the sun. And then I put it out here in Half Moon Bay sunshine, which wasn't very bright, but still this happened to it. So you have to know where your plants come from to, <laughs> to better protect them. And you can acclimate them to more sun gradually if you know they're grown in a shade environment. All right, um, part sun favorites. These are the ones that I like to grow in four to six hours of sunlight. That's roughly half a day or slightly less than a half a day of sun. Um, Echeveria Conte is a very pale color and it seems to handle part sun pretty well. Most Echeverias like at least six hours of sun. This one can handle a little less. The, all of these aeoniums do really well with four hours of sun. And this is a kiwi aeonium here, and this is a swart cup and sunburst and Mardi Gras. And this agave attenuata, this variegated one, it can handle part sun pretty well because of the variegation in the leaves. And here's another Portolacaria, Portolacaria afra variegata. This is a more yellow leafed one than the green leaf one I showed you before. This one can actually be grown in part sun versus the green leaf one prefers more sun. Full sun favorites. Um, here's my garden and my demonstration garden. You're welcome to come back and take a peek at it anytime. Um, it doesn't look like this right now because this agave right here, this uh, agave blue flame and this agave blue glow both died with rot because I have water runoff from the patio right next to it and it and it just saturates this end of the bed. So these two succumb to the rot and the Echeverias were long gone and I had already switched them out. And also this quadricolor agave, that one rotted as well. So, um, and this was because of the excess drainage. Whereas I have these growing in my front garden uh, in a raised bed, like a 12 inch raised bed in the very front of my nursery and they did fine. So it's all a matter of drainage and sunlight. And if you have the more sun and better drainage, then your agaves will do better. Okay, air. Now all roots need need air. And if they, they're saturated with too much water, they will begin to rot. Uh, so choose higher versus lower elevations. As I said before, mounding is helpful. Raised beds like this garden in, in uh, uh, Burlingame. This one is, is doing extremely well now and it's raised up and it's one is my probably my best showcase garden I have. That's it on Howard Avenue in Burlingame. Over here, I planted a succulent bed on the, against a neighbor's driveway and noticed that the rainwater from the downspout drained right along this area all the way to the street. So in order to keep that drier, we had to put in this this drain a uh, hose here, it's about four inch flexible type of plastic um, pipe that you can connect to your downspout and divert your water elsewhere. So just look where your downspouts go, it makes a huge difference. And here's a way of also um, improving drainage by mounding. This is Ocean Colony here in, in Half Moon Bay and there they have the worst soil in the county. I think it's, it's moldable yellow clay it's terrible soil. So that's what you have to do in some cases. All right. So air and nutrients is next. From I'm going to talk about soil. And um, the blacker, the better. So don't be afraid to get your, your hands dirty. Most microbes in the soil are very beneficial, won't harm you. And they actually have, there's studies out there that say these being in touch with these good bacteria is beneficial to your health as well. I won't go into that. That's another subject, but I'm also a registered dietitian, so I'm big, I'm big into prevention and health. <laughs> All right, so the carbon cycle. Um, we can reduce uh, the effects of climate change and improve soil health at the same time. And we need to reduce carbon emissions. We all know about greenhouse gases, and we need to retain more carbon in the earth by taking the carbon from the air and retain, and retain it in the earth. Blacker soil is high in carbon and rich in nutrients. So the blacker, the better. 
uh, keep the soil covered with plants or dead organic matter like mulch or compost or leaves. That's nature's way of fertilizing the soil. In nature, you never see bare soil. The only place you see bare soil is where a gardener comes in and blows the leaves away from the garden beds and blows the mulch away. That's about the only place you see bare soil out here in the suburbs. Um, so nature intended soil to be covered with either dead leaves or mulch or, or dead plants or, or just roots in the ground. Everything should be covered. Um, avoid tilling as much as possible. That, that really will help keep the microbes happy in the soil. And I'll tell you what more about that in a minute. Um, there's also this great documentary called Kiss the Ground that will go into this. And, and uh, it's actually uh, highlights one of the local ranchers here in Half Moon Bay, Market Guard Ranch. So you might wanna take a look at that on Netflix, Kiss the Ground. It's a great documentary. So this soil, let me talk about the soil food web. What I alluded to before is that the microbes help the feed your plants what they need when the plant calls for it. It's called the soil food web. Microbes are crit critical to all life on earth. There are far more beneficial microbes than pathogenic ones in the world. And there are more microbes in one teaspoon of healthy soil than there are people on earth. That's how many are in one teaspoon. So you gotta be kind to these, these microbes because they actually will um, take, they actually feed your plants what they need when the plant roots call for it and they exchange nutrients. So what, what the microbes live on is dead organic matter or roots. So that's why you wanna keep your, your soil covered uh, with, with dead organic matter like maybe a little compost, a little mulch, not much with succulents. You can't go too thick because it would retain too much moisture. I'll discuss that further. But there's this whole soil food web thing that brings in, in not only feeds the plants what they need, but also brings in the protozoa, the nematodes, the worms, and they all help aerate the soil and, and give the soil structure. So not only helps really dead, you know, clay heavy soil, but also sandy soil. So composting and, and layering with mulch improves soil, all soil types. Here's ideal soil um, composition. If you have this, then great. If you don't, you can improve it again with compost and mulch. And in some cases you might have to add something else to it if it's really heavy moldable clay. But ideally you want 50% pore space and that's 25% air and 25% water. You don't want it completely saturated with water. If you do, then the plants might uh, rot on you. It's 45% mineral. So the soil in the earth is different than the soil you buy in bags, from potting mix bags. What you get in the, in the earth is are real true minerals. You get clay, silt, and sand. It's heavy material. The clay holds the nutrients in the water, whereas in potting mix, it's all organic, decomposable material made from wood or moss or peat or um, bar coconut fiber. It's all decomposable. It's not made with minerals. It's not nearly as heavy. And it, it's consumed by the microbes in the roots and it shrinks over time. Whereas soil has all these minerals in it. It won't shrink. It will hold its space, even when you grow things in it. Um, so there's a difference between earth and potty mix. And I just wanted to point that out because people get confused with that. And they think that they, you know, every time they plant something in the garden, they should use potty mix to plant it. And that's not necessarily the case. Potty mix is best used for containers, not in the ground. And then also, it, um, Earth contains at least 5% decomposed organic matter. And this helps improve soil structure, feeds the soil life and retains water and nutrients. And the more organic matter you have in your soil, typically the darker it is in color, the blacker it is. So here's an example of soil from my backyard here. This is, this is the same earth from my backyard. This on the other hand, was mulch for over a year, had mulch on top of it. Notice the aggregates and the porosity of the soil. This is much more porous and lightweight 
than this soil on the other side, which was underneath the parking lot and had no mulch on it. So this is what you can do with even rock hard kind of soil. People tell me, oh, my soil is so rock hard. Well, mine was really hard to begin with. Once you start mulching it and composting it, you're, you're gonna notice a huge difference and in, the, in the texture of your soil and the health of your plants. This is what I call extremely heavy clay soil. This is moldable, moldable clay that you could like, as kids, we used to mold, uh, make ashtrays for our parents. Wasn't that nice? Yeah. So you can mold this into shapes. If you have soil like that, yes, you're going to need to amend it with something other than just a layer of compost or mulch. You're going to, to have to till in three to four inches of this mixture into the first six inches of the soil. And what you wanna do is maybe one third fine redwood or wood shavings and one third quality compost, or I use aged horse manure, but you have to make sure it's aged and not hot or it could carry bacteria. And then uh, one third pumice or coarse sand. And that's what you can do to improve your soil if it's really, really heavy moldable clay. Um, so fertilizing, um, you don't really need to fertilize. People ask me that all the time. Well, what do you give your plants? They look so healthy. And I go, well, it's basically just horse manure and shavings um, and it's aged well, so it doesn't carry pathogens. That's really critical. Uh, that's nature's fertilization. That's the way nature intended it to be. We didn't start using synthetic fertilizer until World War II when people started throwing away all the nitrogen from the nitrogen bombs and they noticed, oh, everything's turning green and growing. This is great stuff. Let's start using more and more of this. Well, that it wasn't necessarily great stuff to use and we're regretting it now. Um, so we, we need to go back to nature. Nature has a plan and, and we need to follow nature's rules basically. And or, you know, organic doing organic gardening is sustainable and synthetic is not. Synthetic fertilizer is made with combustion engines. It's not sustainable. Um, organic feeds the soil life. So organic amendments feed the soil microbes, which in turn feeds the plants indirectly, not directly like, like synthetic fertilizer. And I realized that in pots, it's a different, different scenario. You need, you need some synthetic fertilizer in pots in order to keep your plants healthier um, because they don't have access to all the microbes in the soil, that's why. And so let's say, so, so synthetic, let's say you choose a five to two ratio of NPK, uh, it feeds it directly and usually only contains the NPK, the nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium, whereas whole organic fertilizers contain trace minerals and micronutrients. There's a lot of trace minerals and micronutrients in the soil that they just need to be released by the microbes to get in, given to the plants. So keep in mind, growth does not necessarily equal health. If you throw a lot of synthetic fertilizer out on your plants, you'll probably get a burst of growth, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're healthy and resistant to diseases and pests. All right, so feed your soil, not your plants. This is the Master Gardener mantra. This is what we live by. <laughs> feed your soil microbes. Don't feed your plants directly with synthetic fertilizer. And so this is what I do twice a year. I apply a half inch to one inch of quality compost or soil amendment or aged horse manure with shavings. That's I get this from a local vendor here in Half Moon Bay. He gets it from horse stalls that are not fed grass. So there's no weed seeds in it. That's another disadvantage to using horse manure is you could potentially bring in a lot of weed seeds, but if it's aged well enough and co composted well enough, those will be gone by the time you get it. So I do this twice a year, early fall and spring, and I put a little layer on the surface. I don't go too deep. You know, with other drought tolerant perennials, I would go two to four inches deep with mulch, but you can't do that with succulents because it would retain too much water in the ground. So I just go a half inch to an inch twice a year and my plants are really happy and healthy because of it, I think. I, uh, you can also apply fish emulsion. I know of a landscaper that goes through and does periodic maintenance and they just spray fish emulsion on. It stinks like crazy, but it works. But it's a, it's, it's, it's a liquid and it doesn't seem to last as long as the, uh, 
as the compost or you know the little bit of mini bark you actually will help as well so and other people can you know you can use compost tea or mupu tea um, but again I think those are best for containers and not necessarily the landscape so rocks as mulch are is that good or bad and I know that there's uh, a YouTube a very um, very popular YouTuber out there, Laura Eubanks, with Design for Serenity, and I follow her. I watch her quite often. She does offer a lot of insight into plants that you know look good in the landscape and hold up well. She's in Southern California. It's a little bit different than Half Moon Bay weather, but I do watch her to get, and I've gotten some good tips from her. One thing that I I don't necessarily agree with is using rocks for mulch. Um, she likes to use it, but in my experience, it, it just gets churned into the soil. Every time you move it, remove a plant, you're trying to take the rocks off and remove them and then putting them back. Plus, the primary reason I don't use them is because it's not feeding the soil life. You know, it's not dead organic material that feeds the soil microbes. So your plants, I think, are going to be healthier if you feed them a little bit of mulch or compost versus rocks. And rocks can overheat and cause other issues, which I'll elaborate on next. So yes. the yes. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. You had spoken about the mupu tea and we had a question in the chat about whether or not you can use cattle manure as fertilizer. Is that what your mupu tea is suggesting? Actually, that's a brand name, mupu tea. And I, I don't know where they get their their <laughs> yeah, it's cattle. It is cow manure. But, um, you know, you have to consider the source of where it comes from. And most of its stockyard comes from stockyards. And um, yeah, I mean, if you don't eat it, I think it's probably fine to use. But um, yeah, um, I'm going to elaborate that on that a little bit further, I think, in another slide. But I, I would only use that in containers primarily on, and not so much in the landscape. Okay. Um, I, yeah, okay, sure. Um, rocks as mulch, pros and cons. So it, it does suppress weeds better than wood mulches, especially if you put weed cloth underneath the rocks. And that's the only time I would ever use weed cloth is if you're putting a couple inches of rocks on top of it to keep the weed cloth down. Because every time you use weed cloth and then you cover it with mulch, guess what happens? The weed cloth comes up on the edges and pretty soon the mulch decomposes and you've got weed cloths all over the place and it looks messy and it's not a good idea. Um, the rocks are best for desert specimens that don't require many nutrients. Like if you want to do a specimen garden with a cactus and agave, then yeah, go for it. Use weed cloth and rocks and they'll probably be fine because they don't require very many nutrients. They're desert plants. Um, they can add design elements. They're fireproof, which is great because there's some people that out there that might be required by their insurance company to make your first 20 feet of your landscape next to your house fireproof, and rocks will do that for you. Succulents also fit the bill. So I think that if you put succulents out there with just a little bit of mulch, they'll that'll pass the test, I'm thinking. Uh, depends on your um, fire agency, I think, or your insurance company, I should say. Uh, and they can, and the rocks can also provide a buffer zone for dogs. So if you have dogs walking along the curb that are always getting into your landscape, well, then if you have a rock border, that helps keeps the dogs off of your landscape. The cons are that, it, as I said, it can overheat the roots in hot climates. They don't feed the soil life. Uh, they limit the spreading of tapestry des designs. Um, if you're trying, if you put rocks around your plants and you want those plants to spread, it's harder for them to spread with rocks around them than, than a little bit of compost or mulch. And it also increases soil compaction. So that's another reason not to, not to use it in my opinion. Okay, so watering. Um, now, a lot of people come to my nursery and they say, well, so these don't need very much water, right? And I go, well, not necessarily. When they're dry, you want to water them thoroughly. Don't just spritz them. Don't just run the hose over it a couple of times like that. No, you want to really soak them to six inches in depth when you water. And then you want to wait until they're almost dry at six inches or dry to your finger and then water them well again. 
and this may be a shock to all you people out there, but I haven't watered my landscape plants since the first big storm in October. Um, unless I've unless I've replaced plants, and if they're newly planted, yes, I have watered them. But the established plants, I have not watered since the first rain in October. Now in Santa Clara, you may have had to do it sooner uh, because you're warmer than we are over here. So I, I know that's a factor, but um, just dig down. If you're not sure if it's wet down there, take a shovel, dig down a few inches. If you see wet soil, wait, don't water yet, okay? You can save a lot of water that way. Uh, I use, when I do water, I use like a, um, a head like this that disperses a lot of water at one time with a shutoff valve right behind it so I don't have to go to the hose, the hose bib and turn it off. This is a moisture meter, one example. There's another one called X-Lux that's very highly rated. X and then X and then L-U-X, that's how it's spelled. Um, and when you water, don't just don't just water half the plant with a little drip system. You know, a lot of people use these little spaghetti tube drip systems where the little tube goes to one side of the plant and then the next plant gets another little tube. And um, that, that can take hours to water the area thoroughly and to water the entire root zone. A lot of times it only waters like half the plant. And so the roots tend to migrate towards the water on that side. So we we recommend watering with something like this, which has emitters built into the half inch tubing. This is called Netafim, N-E-A-F-I-M. Um, there are other brands out there that have the emitters built into it. And I usually, nowadays I'm recommending that you use the subsurface irrigation, not the surface one, because then you're gonna see this on the top of the surface of your soil. If you go subsurface down three inches, then you, will, you won't you uh, will see the tubing even when the compost or mulch is, is dissipated. So there is a subsurface particular brand that you need to look for. And this is what I think Laura Eubanks also uses, the subsurface one. Uh, and then Foothill College recommended it as well. They go down nine inches, I think they said. And I think they do that because they have deeper roots, deeper root systems where their plants. But... Um, yeah, just make sure you would, you're watering the entire zone, not just each individual half of a plant. And uh, they, you know, those drips, those little quarter inch drip lines, they break all the time. If you have one leak over here, then it affects all the rest of the landscape. They may not get enough water. I've seen so many plants die because of the broken drip lines. So you want to go hefty and, and hearty with these as much as possible. All right. Um, Oh, here's the, my Bosca rain barrels. I have two of these that I got through Bosca. And I won't go into that because they've already discussed it, but they're great. We use them here all the time. We get fog, a lot of fog run off into our barrels here in Half Moon Bay. So um, signs of underwatering are um, shrivel leaves and dry dryness. So these leaves up here are definitely shriveled and these are definitely dry. If these leaves were well hydrated and not shriveled, then I would say this might be a normal uh, desiccation of the, of the foliage that happens when they grow and they just normally exfoliate like that. But these are also shriveled. So this is definitely a um, dried out plant, plus the shriveled roots as well. Here again, you can see shriveled leaves and air roots. So these are, these are roots coming from the top of the plant, not underneath in the ground but they're seeking out water because they're so thirsty. And here's another example of a well-hydrated swart capaeonium versus an underhydrated one where it, up here it's very narrow, where it got a lot less water during a certain time period. And the leaves are showing, uh, are much smaller because of the result of lack of water. How do you tell if you've water, overwatered or if you're, if you're suffering from rotted plants, well, these are telltale signs. Here is an aeonium stem rot where it just folds over and bends and flex is flexible. That's that's what can happen sometimes when you water them too much in their dormant season in the summer. Sometimes, um, this bl these black spots are actually uh, leaf rot, and that happens a lot with agaves. These, this is a leaf rot in a kiwi aeonium where the leaves are falling off. 
This is a uh, leaf rot of an Echeveria where they're getting slimy and uh, black around the edges. And here's that agave that I lost recently due to the storms. And it just started turning yellow and black underneath. Now keep in mind, rot, rot happens from the ground up usually, not from the top down. So if you see damage on the top, that's, that's cold damage or frost damage versus rot damage comes from the bottom. And here's Kalanchoes that have, um, have stem rot as well. Okay, now we're here for the question time. <laughs> Do you have any questions for me? Victoria or Domingo, any, any questions out there? Yes, so we had, the first one is from Karen asking if we'll get the presentations. Yes, they will be sent out, though in a couple of weeks, they will get to your email. Um, you already answered the one about cattle manure. Uh -huh. Then we have another one that Diana is asking if there is a way to get ionium to branch out. Um, aeoniums to branch out will give them more space to grow. If you try to grow an aeonium in a tiny little pot, and uh, I'm hope I'm thinking that she's talking landscape here and not pots, but you know, they just need room to grow and they need at least four hours of sun. And usually aeoniums will, will start branching out and, and doing quite well. Some are more shrubbier than others. And some are more compact, like an aeonium velour grows more like a shrub, doesn't have that arboreal look to it, whereas an uh, Aeonium swart cop tends to be more arboreal and tree-like and branches. So some are, stay compact and some tend to be more tree-like. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Brian is asking if, he's, um, I think we, you touched over this a little bit, but is there a good succulent ground cover? Um, yeah. Um, in the landscaping section, I'm going to go into that. And um, do tell me when I need to stop because you st you had some introductions going on, so I wasn't sure how much time I have. But I do discuss that in the landscape section, which comes up next. Um, then Mary is asking if, um, can you share the best ways to propagate succulents? That YouTube video that I'm going to show at the end, I probably won't have time to show it, but there's there is the URL there that she can follow or Google Janice Moody Succulent Propagation YouTube, and you'll find my YouTube and you can watch that. I think this is a rather, it's a more, I don't know, personal or taste question on how you relate to your succulents, but how do you decide, do you decide layout for color, height, distribution? Yeah, that's in the next section of design. Uh huh. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. And then the last one, I think this is going to be the last one for this section, and then we'll move to your the next part of your presentation. Is there a way to manage the size of succulents when they are in landscape? In our neighborhood, we see succulents that have gotten way too big for their space. Um. Well. I think maybe that's part of the landscape design section. So I'll I'll go into that. Yeah, Perfect. you want to you want to choose the right plant for the right spot. And um, I always warn people when they're buying this little tiny plant for me. I say, okay, now keep in mind that rock purslane is going to grow four to five feet wide. And so some people don't don't envision that or don't listen, and and that's what happens. But well, I'm going to go into that as well. Okay. Perfect. Then you can move to the next uh, section. Unless okay. Victoria has something to say. Okay. Does Victoria have anything? Nope. We're all set. Okay. All yeah. right. Let's, get, let's move on then. Okay. Uh, landscape design. Um, this does not happen to be one of my designs. Uh, I do garden designs as well as have the nursery here, but this is a neighbor's and I asked permission to show it. It's a, it's a beautifully designed garden. And I'll, I'll highlight it a little bit more as I go through the slides. Um, first, let's talk about garden size. Um, as I said before, they're fragile and shouldn't be walked on. So you need to create pathways 
or have stepping stones or not make them too deep so that you can't reach them from all sides. Uh, in this case here, this, that garden you just saw, my neighbor's garden, she created pathways in her garden so that she could access all the plants easily without damaging others. It, it was well, well laid out and designed. Uh, here's, I had a client who had a disability and had to carry an oxygen, ox, oxygen tank with her to do her gardening. So she put in these steps in between. So she had a place to rest and that worked out well for her. And then this other client decided to put little stepping stones that look like footprints in her garden. So there's all different ways of creating pathways and steps to access your plants. Here in the front of my place, um, you may not notice it, but I have like a foot of space behind this garden that I can walk behind and, and actually weed and, and trim plants and that sort of thing from the rear as well as the front. So this is a sidewalk in front. And then I have a foot of space in the back. And note, I put up a 18 inch wire fence around this initially because I didn't want the dogs jumping into it. So if you put up a little 18 inch wire fence, that really helps keep the dogs off of your landscape. And across the street in Kitty Fernandez Park, I planted this, now it's much bigger, but this is accessible from all sides. So, and it's raised beds, so it's ideal for a succulent garden. So design basics, I'm gonna talk about um, color contrast, shapes and textures and heights and layers. And, I, I think I'll be able to get through this with, within the hour and a half that I have now. If, and I'm not sure we're going to get to maintenance or not, but we'll, we'll give it a try. I'm going to, I talk fast, so let me get going. Um, color wheel. Basically, when I design things, I usually use complementary colors that are across from each other on the color wheel, and they that makes them tend to pop in the landscape. But a lot of times I'll go with warm or cool colors. If I want a warm palette, for instance, I'll choose the red, oranges, and yellows on this side of the color wheel. Or if I want a cooler climate, ocean colors, for instance, then I may go with this palette and it, it's more of a pastel color palette that also looks great. So it all depends on what you want your landscape to end up like. And I'll show you some examples. Here's a similar hue and cool colors. So this is more the pastel here and the cool colors on the right. And this is that agave I told you about that is supposed to only get six feet, it's now 10 feet in my backyard. So be careful what you wish for. Um, here's an Echeveria and, and surrounded by Oscularia. So that's also pastel kind of similar hue and cool colors. Now here's a warm, warm color palette, which is greens and oranges and yellows. And that's, that's also very pleasing to the eye. I think. And then there's complementary colors, which really pop in the landscape. And I'm also a big fan of this. So I, I tend to use a lot of things. If you look at the color wheel, your opposite of green is red. And those happen to be Christmas colors. If you ever wondered why green and red look good together, it's because they're opposite on the color wheel. Uh, yellow and purple look great together. Here's yellow and purple combination. And it, and it looks wonderful in the landscape. Um, here's also a purple yellow combination. And then there's also a blue orange um, right here. Here's a blue orange color combination that looks striking. And this is a friend of mine, her uh, Cynthia Nations. She's a fellow master gardener. This is what she did in her backyard. And she's got a lot of complementary colors going on here, a lot of pops of color. And I also tend to use contrasting brightness. Um, so I tend to use this Formian black adder quite a bit. And this is a container, but I also use this in the landscape quite a bit. And I plant this with the yellows and because you need a little vertical nature in your in your landscape. And it's hard to get that with succulents. There are there are some that are that tend to be a little taller in nature, like some yuccas and some aloes, for instance. But for the most part, you know, you're lacking this vertical texture and, and, and height. So I use formiums and, or cordylines a lot. And this happens to be contrasting in uh, brightness. And as well as the swart cop, I combine the swart cop a lot with the sunburst and the uh, aeonium Mardi Gras. 
You also want to vary the shape and textures in your garden. You don't want them all to be the same texture. That would be pretty boring. If you used, if you had a garden full of aeoniums, I think that would be pretty boring after a while. You want to mix it up. Try to use as many textures and, and shapes as you can. For instance, this, this Echeveria combination, has, even though there's two Echeverias, the Oscularia lends a little diversity and shape here. And then over here, um, the formiums add a different uh, shape and texture to this to this landscape as well, as well as the agave gives that agave gives you the vertical uh, nature that you're that you're looking for. Um, and here in this uh, Ruth Brancroft garden, here's a lot of use of um, vertical the cactus in the background and this um, agave in the foreground uh, that lends a lot of diversity to the landscape. And um, here's some other colorful companion plants that are not necessarily um, succulents. Uh, Leucodendron, I use quite a bit as a, as a backdrop. If you want something with height and pops of color, then a Safari Sunset is great, or this Safari Gold Strike. And lately I've been using a lot of uh, Leucospermums because they have a, they're a pin cushion flower. They have a really bright pin cushion flower that's also a great backdrop if you're looking to fill a deep bed, for instance. And this is a Formium Golden Ray. I use this quite a bit. And this Cordyline Electric Pink is also a great one and looks great with certain pink hues. Um, and this, oh, Bechonary Yocoides Flamingo Glow. This is a, a new favorite of mine and it's considered a succulent because it holds water in its core. Uh, it's from the Yucca family and this beautiful flower, it's just gorgeous. So this is one of my new favorites in the garden. And you probably all heard the expression thrillers, fillers, and spillers. I did not coin that phrase. That's been around a long time. I don't know who started it, but it's typically used for container gardening where you want to put something with height or something that pops and draws your eye to it. That's called your thriller. And then you want something lower around the thriller at, to act as a filler. And then you want something to spill over the container if it's a tall container, for instance. And in the landscape, you can you can adapt this same um, same theory to the landscape by calling your taller plants your thrillers. In this case, we've got an agave um, back here, a variegated one. It's much bigger now. And this is these are leucodendrons back here as well. Those could be considered your thrillers. Even the turtle could be considered a thriller. They these this. Uh, Family really fell in love with the turtle, so I said I would work it into their landscape, and it be and it's become a thriller, you might say, because it's a focal point. And then fillers are great fillers are aeoniums because they're usually lower in height. Although there's some that are cyclops, they're called cyclops. They get really tall, but I think a lot of times um, these make great fillers. And then the spillers are the ground covers. These lower ones in the front here, this these uh, sedum. Um, lemon balls and um, some echeverias, some of the and some aloes, the low aloes in the front. So anything you want to layer it always from your vantage point. So you want to go from high to medium to low, depending on your vantage point. If the vantage point is circular in nature, then you want your thriller in the center of the circle, and then your fillers are surrounding it, and then lower ones around the outskirts of your garden bed. But if you're doing it against a home, then you want your tall ones to be back further so you can visually see everything from your vantage point. You don't wanna hide plants. You don't wanna hide a cute little echeveria way in the back somewhere and not be able to see it. You wanna put those in the forefront so you can see everything on a layered effect. Okay, so um, as I said, here's your tall specimens, and I won't go elaborate on this too much, but here in this in this garden, she used this um, artwork, this uh, metal artwork as, in, as a cactus, as one of the thrillers. And this aloe tree, aloe over here, is also a thriller. And this agave, a media pick to alba, can be considered a thriller. And then here, you can use a pot. And this is a circular one where there's a pathway all the way around it. And they used a pot as the centerpiece there. Fillers, again, are the aeoniums and echeverias, typically. Um, I won't go 
discuss this too long because of time constraints. And do tell me when we get close to the end time. Um, here's the spillers, are also known as the ground covers when you're talking landscape. And here are some of my favorites. Um, the red pagoda, I don't use as much as I used to because it doesn't hold up in winter as well as, um, there's another one called Crassula. Um, oh, I'll think of it in a minute. The sedum rubricictum or jelly bean is a nice one. It, it again, doesn't look good after a winter, but it's it's not too bad. Oh, it's the Crassula campfire is the one I use more of right these days. And here it is over here in the corner. Crassula campfire. That one holds up a little bit better than this Crassula red pagoda after a winter. Um, we've got the Echeveria elegans. I use this. It's kind of a hen and chick Echeveria. I use that a lot in borders, as well as this um, Sedum repressor angelina. Oh, that's over here. All right, a lemon ball. And yeah, Let's see. And make sure your, your border plants pop in the landscape. Don't, don't put sempervivums there unless they're bright in color because sempervivums get lost in the landscape. They're kind of small. But if you use a brightly colored sempervivum hen and chick, then yeah, go ahead and use it. Uh, here's other some poppers that I call that really pop that with some bright colors. This lemon ball sedum is great. This red pagoda, as I said, is okay when it's looking this good. Doesn't always look that good. The Echeveri afterglow is one of my favorites. That happens to be on my logo because that's one of my favorite plants. And the sunburst is a great one too for popping in the landscape. So succulents for large spaces. Someone asked about how do you avoid overplanting? Well, you gotta you gotta do your research and ask the nursery or ask or do Google it and say how big does it grow? Hopefully it'll give you an accurate answer because um, this calendrinia right here, rock purslane, one little plant will grow that big, and that's about four feet or five feet in width. So you have to give it a lot of space. This torch aloe here, it starts out maybe a foot high and then eventually it builds upon itself and it can get six feet tall. And here's some other ones of my favorites. Cyclops aeonium gets about four feet tall. Agave americana mediopicta, um, four to five feet. And I won't go into all these because they're listed here, but just keep in mind, do your research before you start planting. We have about five minutes left. Okay, I probably just get through the landscape part, and um, maybe they can just read the um, the maintenance tips. Or, you know, you can, they can get the slides and and gather the information they need from those slides. And and they and they recorded. I have another recorded session at Linkso Garden Materials that they can always watch. That includes the care and maintenance as well. Um, so this is these are my demonstration gardens. Come take a peek anytime you want in the uh, this at least in the back, but I also have some in the front. Um, yeah, so that's my demonstration garden in the front. Uh, this is to the front, and this is the park across the street that I recently planted. And here's my favorites. Um, okay, this one is one of the ones I use a lot in landscapes, the rock purslane, calendrinia, as I mentioned. I cut it back to a little ball of stems, oftentimes after a couple of years, because it does look stemmy after a while. Sometimes it just dies for no reason, but so be it. Um, the aloes polyphyla is one of my favorites, prefers cooler climates or afternoon shade. Um, these are my agave favorites, and they're listed here, so I won't go into all of them. These stiffer leafed agaves, just take note, the stiffer the leaf, the slower the grower, but the hardier they are in the wintertime as well. Um, Echeveria favorites, the afterglow is on the left, the Conte is here. This is the elegance, a nice little border plant, the hen and chicks, and this is a lady Aquarius. Here's my favorites. I've already mentioned a lot of these in the past slides, so I won't go into them again. And here's my ground cover favorites. For those people that asked about my ground cover favorites, they're all listed here for you. Pollinators, if you want pollinators, here's a chart that you can look up. 
and um, attract more bees and butterflies and hummingbirds. And aloes attract a lot of hummingbirds. If you want hummingbirds, plant an aloe. Okay, um, so I don't think we're gonna have time to do the care and maintenance, but everyone can read those slides or they can watch my presentation that I did for Lingso Garden Materials a couple of months ago. All right. We did have a few additional questions. Uh, one of them you just addressed with the habitat plant. Somebody was asking, um, do succulents create useful habitat for local bees and birds? And you did mention about the aloes for the humming, hummingbirds and some others. Yeah, um, Aeoni a by the way, aeoniums, uh, when they bloom, they're beautiful and they attract a lot of bees too. Excellent. Mm -hmm. And we have a question, can heavy rain cause an agave to bloom earlier than it should? She had one bloom after the rains, two bloom after the rains this past winter at only two years old. Oh, an early death. Oh, um, well, it may have been a couple of years old before she planted it, perhaps, because typically I, you know, I don't see agaves, I see agaves living at about five years or, or more. I mean, the century plant, the one in my backyard that's 10 feet wide, is called a century plant and it lives 20 to 30 years. <laughs> and then when they bloom, they die, unfortunately, right. but, they, but they're prolific puppers. They're constantly pupping and giving babies off, so... Yeah. <laughs> and we had an additional question. I think this is the last. What are good complementary plants for barrel cactus? I don't plant <laughs> barrel cactus very often. <laughs> um, wow. Well, I, you know, if you want to keep with the, with the cactus kind of desert theme, you could do opuntia. You could plant an opuntia, taller opuntia behind it. Um, I, I, you know, I'm sorry, I'm not that knowledgeable about cactus because I've never even, I think I planted one cactus in the years that I've been doing this. So I have them for sale, mind you, but I don't actively use them in our landscapes in Half Moon Bay, unfortunately. Oh. She was clarifying that question with, uh, she was thinking a ground cover to accompany the barrel cactus, maybe a oh, ground cover. Ground cover. Oh, I, that's rough. That's hard because you don't, you don't want it to spread very, very quickly into your, into your barrel cactus because then getting, getting those plants out from, un, you know, entangled, entangled in your cactus is rough. So maybe something like an Echeveria elegans that spreads slowly and doesn't is not as invasive as like a sedum ruprestre. That would probably kind of get in the crevices and be hard to clean out. Yeah, that's hard. It's a tough one. Thank you. She says. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> and I think that's it for our questions in the chat. Okay, great. Yeah. So we don't have any more time to do care and maintenance, correct? We're not going to be doing that. Um, I mean, our class technically ends at 730. If you okay. would like to continue or if others would like to stay, that's up to you. Um, I'm OK if it's recorded and people can benefit from it. You know, I, it doesn't take that long to go through the last slide. So if you want me to, I can. Well, that that's your choice. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Uh, it's not bedtime yet. Almost. So we'll okay. keep going. All right. Okay. Here we go. Um, we're going to talk about plant maintenance and pests in this segment. All right. Um, we're going to discuss removal of lower dead leaves. That's a natural process that lower leaves just naturally die off and new leaves appear from the ap apical tip of the plant. Um, talk a little bit about transplanting, dividing, discarding or sharing, and pruning back and deadheading spent flowers. Uh, this is what an aeonium looks like, especially in the summer months. You see a lot of dead leaves, and all I do is yank them and pull them off, and it, they look good again. It's, it's a normal gr growth process. Sometimes, you know, they could be too dry, but most of the time it's just a n n normal growth process. Transplanting succulents is easy because I said before, the, shell, the roots are very shallow. Take a shovel, hit them with a the shovel. They come out really easily and easily moved. They don't suffer for it at all. 
They don't ha have an acclimation period like another drought tolerant plant might, you know, with deep roots, those are much harder to transplant. These are much easier and then dividing them is also very easy. Um, yeah, here's, here's how you divide uh, pups from, let's say, an agave. Agaves are constantly pupping at the stem area around here, or they send out a, a stolen like this and can travel several feet from the plant, and then you can just pull them out. They're easier to pull out when they're farther away from the agave. Believe me, I have the scars to prove it. If you try to get in here and get these little guys before they're too big and easily reachable, then you're going to be, damn it, you're going to have scars all over your arms like I do. Um, deadheading and pruning. Once the aeonium it blooms and the bees have had their share of it, then uh, I lop it off here because this part dies. But you also have new growth from the from the base. If you if you're treating your plants right, you you, you will always have new growth from the base of the aeonium. Uh, here, when they when the blooms expire, I just prune them off when they no longer are attractive to hummingbirds. Echeveria blooms attract hummingbirds really readily. So once they're expired and dry, then I cut them off and um, I prune back anything that gets too invasive like this Oscularia deltoides can grow to four to five feet in the landscape. So I'm always pruning that back away from plants. This is a calendrinia. Here is it before picture. Here is after I pruned it. And when I want to um, decrease the size of this plant, I usually just grab from the bottom here and yank. And then you can also use that to propagate a new plant from that if you like. Um, so that's another way to keep, keep the size back is just by grabbing these rock purslane pieces from the bottom and yanking. Uh, pests, okay, the number one, the big three, snails and cabbage moth larvae, these little tiny little critters and aphids. Um, those are the three I'm gonna discuss quickly for you. Oh, and also I told you I was gonna discuss gophers. Now, normally gophers don't go after a um, succulent roots because they're very thin in nature, but agaves and aloes are an exception. And the core of an agave is very juicy. This one gopher destroyed this huge agave that had to be six feet tall. And he just he just ate up right through the center, and that's dirt you see right there. So he ate up right through the core and killed the plant. So do you might want to cage those those and put a big tree size cage around around your uh, prize aloes or your prize uh, agaves just to protect them. The others, I don't think it's really worth the effort to cage them because, as I said, these roots are not attracted uh, by gophers. Deer damage is rare, but I did see this when the deer were extremely hungry and thirsty. They did eat this blue flame leaf, like an artichoke leaf. That rarely ever happens, though, especially the, the spikier ones. They will not touch the spikier ones. Snails and slugs. Um, so here I went out one night with my headlamp on and found about a dozen snails all over the Senecio. And you can also tell they've been around by the little notches they take out of the leaves here. So that's a that's a telltale sign of snails. I won't go into it, all the, the little things you can do here, but it's listed for you. And usually I go out at night and hunt them down and squish them or feed them to your chickens. That's a better th option. If you've got chickens, they chickens love snails or give them to your neighbor, neighbor's chickens. Um, you can also sprinkle iron phosphate uh, bait that's um, harmless to animals and children and so forth. And that's something like sluggo. Not the sluggo plus, but just plain sluggo as, is, is a iron phosphate and it's the safest one to use. Aphids, normally aphids in the landscape are not a big issue for me. This year was an exception. I think it was because we had all that heavy rain and all the extra foliar growth and all the aphids were being knocked off continuously from the plants with the rain. And then when the rain stopped, oh my gosh, they invaded the plants terribly, especially the flowers. You'll see them on the Echeveria flowers first. And you know you can try various things to, to keep them off, but I usually just pick those flowers off to keep the aphids from spreading. 
uh, spraying them with water, sometimes that works, but um, sometimes they're really sticky and they, they doesn't come off with, with water. So I usually just pick them off and then compost, put a little layer of compost down because the healthier the plant, the more resilient they are to pests. It's been a proven, there is scientific proof to that subject. Keep them healthy. This leaf rolling larvae, this little cabbage moth larva, it, it takes this apical tips right out, makes a little webby, webby area here and they hide in leaves in rolled up leaves. So you have to kind of hunt them down. And usually if I see evidence like this, I, I hunt them down and find the leaf they're hiding in and then no more problems. Or you can spray with a BT, a Bacillus thuringiensis BT, it's short for. Um, and that's not harmful and that's safe to use as well. And, but it all comes from this little cabbage moth. He lays the eggs and then this is what happens. And here it is again. This, if you see a lot of webbiness in the apical tip of your aeoniums, that's more than likely a leaf rolling larva like this and you just have to hunt them down. Okay, and then that's my propagation video that I'm not gonna show, but you can watch it on YouTube later. And, I, and let me just keep, and then I can, that's it. And I want to thank uh, everyone, Bosca, the host, for, for sponsoring this. And I hope you walked away with um, more knowledge than you came with in the beginning. There's also some slides in the end showing you the hours that we have available for our you know, on-site visits to Master Gardeners. You can ask us questions on site if you like, or just through email or phone, as I said before. Uh, this is for San Mateo County. I apologize again. I should have put the Santa Clara County information up there, but you can find this by Googling Santa Clara County Master Gardeners and get the same information. And there's my references and so acknowledgements. Okay, well, um, thank you again. And any additional questions? Oh, it looks like one just popped up. Oh, so Joyce said, wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you for staying a few minutes after. It was worth it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> glad. <laughs> okay. You're welcome. It was, it's always a pleasure. I enjoy what I do and I should have done it my whole life. I regret not doing this my whole life. Well, you've made it sound very appealing. So thank you for your enthusiasm. It was a wonderful presentation and I did learn a lot. <laughs> okay, great. I talk fast. Yeah. All right. <laughs> are we are we done? Yes. Yes. Well, thank okay. you everyone for attending and the presentation will be distributed in the next couple of weeks. And thanks again, Janice Moody. All right. Take care. Good night. Happy, gar happy gardening. <laughs> happy gardening. Yes. Thank you, Janice. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you.